Hi, this is Chris. In the last video, I made the floating point addition circuit more efficient by limiting the size of the significand registers. In this video, there's more efficiency improvement and some additional functionality. In the last video, I walked through an explanation of why, even though the new addition circuit doesn't compute the intermediate sum exactly in all cases, that the rounding still happens correctly when the add-end significand is subtracted from the aug-end significand. Explain why, when the two significands are added, rather than subtracted, rounding still works correctly. As I showed in the last video, as long as the add-end was shifted 13 or fewer bits to the right, the difference of the aug-end significand and the add-end significand was exact. The same is true when the two significands are added. So the values used by the rounding module have the correct value for addition when the shift amount is 13 bits or fewer. This case is actually easier than when the significands were subtracted. On your screen, you can see that I'm adding two numbers. The most important thing about the significands is that their most significant bits are both 1. The other n-sig bits in the significand may have any combination of zeros and 1s. The thing to take note of really is the exponents. You'll see that the aug end has an exponent of 11, and the add end has an exponent of minus 1. From these two exponents, we calculate the shift amount by computing 11 minus negative 1. The result, of course, is 12. This shift amount is large enough that none of the significant bits in the aug end are in the same columns as the significant bits in the add end. In this case, the sum of the two significands is the same as if we had ordered the significands together. You can quickly see that the last bit of the significand for the sum gets its value from the last bit of the aug end. That is, the add end contributes nothing to this bit. This bit becomes last kept bit is odd in the rounding module. For any larger shift amount, the value of this bit will never change. We can also see that the most significant bit of Y bar is zero, and it will remain zero for any larger shift amount. This bit is used as the deciding bit is one value, so for any larger shift amount, this flag will always be false. The remainder of Y bar will have all of the bits of the add end significant. Because the most significant bit of the add end will always be one, the remainder of Y bar will never be zero. Consequently, the flag remaining bits are non-zero will always be true for any larger shift amount. From this you should be able to see that even when the operands have the same sign and the significands are rounded, that rounding still happens correctly. Now it's time to make a small improvement to the addition circuit. The zero flag isn't needed. Look at the for loop, which renormalizes the significand when the two operands are being subtracted. If during any of the passes through the loop, the bits being tested by the mask have at least one bit set to one, then norm sig is not equal to zero, and the zero flag will be set to false. The for loop executes c log two underscore n sig minus one times, once for each bit in n a. If norm sig is zero, then every bit in n a will be set. If norm sig has any bit set to 1, then at least one of the bits of NA will be 0, and the 0 flag will be false. The 0 flag is only true when all of the bits of NA are true, and applying the AND reduction operator to NA will yield true only when all of the bits in NA are true. So the 0 flag is redundant because we can get the same information from NA and we can delete the declaration, initialization, and computation of the zero flag from the code. The if statement, which constructs the return value, can now use ampersand NA to determine if the difference of the two significands was zero. As of the last video, the significand registers no longer grow exponentially for the 32, 64, and 128-bit floating point formats. So this version of the code can compute some sig for these additional data types. Of course, we have to support computing absig for the other binary data types as well. One last code cleanup. 
In a previous video, I cited section 6.3 of the IEEE 754 standard which says, when x is 0, x plus x, and x minus negative x have the sign of x. I have changed the way the value is selected when both input operands are 0. It seemed to me that this more correctly implements the intent of section 6.3. If you have a different opinion, please feel free to explain your position in the comments. I'm still learning here too. It's likely some of you have anticipated the next change. The addition circuit already supports performing subtraction when one of the operands is positive and the other is negative. Addition and subtraction are really two sides of the same coin. A positive number minus another positive number is the same as adding a positive number and a negative number. A positive number minus a negative number is the same as adding a positive number and another positive number. A negative number minus another negative number is the same as adding a negative number and a positive number. Finally, a negative number minus a positive number is the same as adding two negative numbers. To begin, I change the name of the module to indicate that it's no longer just an addition module, but an addition and a subtraction module. Then I added a new flag to the argument list to control whether the circuit is being invoked to perform an addition or a subtraction. When the flag is false, the circuit still performs addition. When the flag is true, the circuit now performs subtraction. We first use the subtraction flag to flip the value of the register which holds the sign of B, that is the second operand passed into the module. When the first operand passed into the module, called A, is 0 and B is non-zero, we use B as the return value, but we make sure that the sign of B has been flipped when necessary. Likewise, when A is finite and B is infinite, we construct the return value from B with its corrected sign bit. I updated the CMP add FPGA test harness so it now also tests subtraction. There are several significant changes. The first is that the code now loops through all of the finite values twice. The first time for addition and the second time for subtraction. Now when there is a test failure, the string error is displayed. If the test succeeds, the string good is displayed. I like this better because these two messages contain at least some characters which aren't valid hexadecimal digits making it easier to differentiate the success failure messages from the binary values generated by the test harness. You can see what the display of these strings looks like here. Dip switches 13, 14, and 15 are used to more easily display debug information. When switch 13 is on, the LEDs display whether the operation under test is addition or subtraction, and the value of the rounding mode. When switch 13 is off, switches 14 and 15 control which input-output values are displayed. Of course, the switches 0 through 3 still control which rounding mode is selected. You can find the details in the comments in the cmpadd.v file. While the FPGA harness is used to test all of the finite input values, the simulation testbench fp underscore as underscore tb.v is used to test the exceptional cases, signaling NANDs, quiet NANDs, zeros, and infinities. As a bonus, the testbench also computes the first few values in the Fibonacci sequence, but only for the binary 16 values. As usual, the comment section gives the location of the GitHub repository for the code described in this video. Please share this video with friends and colleagues who might have an interest in the series. Questions and comments are welcome in the comment section. If you found this video useful, please click like below. While you're at it, subscribe to the channel, then click the bell to be notified when new videos are available. Thanks!